When you think about the potential of technology, what it does is it allows people to connect. It allows people to communicate across distance, across communities, uh, across all the sorts of divides and, and, and things that divide us as people. There's a recognition in this administration of just how powerful that is. I'm Devin Stewart from Carnegie Council. Welcome, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I have the the probably the most fun, uh, the funnest job uh, in, in the room. I get to keep everyone in line and simply introduce our speakers. Um, real quick, I, you know, I would like to mention, uh, this is the second, I believe the second or third time we've done something with Japan Society and the Carnegie Council on uh, digital social responsibility, ethics, and technology, and it's a real pleasure, and I hope we can continue. Um, Auspiciously, in the uh, New York Times yesterday, we, we saw Google and Sony uh, tying up to create Google TV. So despite my, um, my provocatively dark uh, cover story this week in, in the Newsweek, um, in Newsweek Japan, and last week it was in Newsweek uh, Global Edition, where uh, they, they called my Newsweek piece um, Toyota and the End of Japan. I'm very sorry. <laughs> very sorry. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't pick the title. Um, I, I know, and I mentioned uh, some of the trends in society, like, like um, for example, um, asa for, or, uh, ara, arasa or ara for people around 30s and their 40s who are, who are choosing to stay home. And we have the hikiku, hikikumori uh, expert in, in the back of the room, um, Michael Zelensiger. Um, it's great to see you, Michael, and, and uh, it's a great audience here. So uh, you, didn't hear, you didn't come here to see me, so I'm going to turn it over to um, this incredible panel, and then I will, I will uh, guide the conversation. Um, it's a great pleasure. I'm going I'm to introduce one at a time. So um, Kevin Werbach, he's from um, the Wharton School. You have the bios. Um, uh, these, uh, some of these bios are, are more than a, more, it looks like almost a pa more than a page long. So it's... Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, um, but, but suffice it to say, I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning a lot. Uh, I, think, I think that despite some of the, the negative and counter trends to, to IT, um, I think the, the general um, direction is positive toward a more open society that, that Japan and the United States share um, as a common value. Uh, so uh, Kevin Warbach, um, I, I give it to you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I appreciate uh, the invitation to come. I think ICTs are a major area where Japan and the United States can learn from each other, uh, although I was, I was disappointed to hear Mr. Takizawa-san mention uh, Hideki Matsui as the example because I'm a Philadelphia Phillies fan living in Philadelphia, and so I'm not quite so happy with, with Mr. Matsui's success in the World Series last year, but putting that aside, um, this is certainly an area where both countries have tremendous accomplishments but also face tremendous challenges. I'd like to speak to you a little bit about the Obama administration and describe its approach to the internet and ICTs, uh, and then hopefully we can, we can follow up in the discussion and, and go more deeply into some other aspects. Um, my experience is that I was involved from the early days of the Obama campaign uh, as part of his technology, media, and telecommunications policy advisory group then after the election served on the transition team for the new administration leading the review of the Federal Communications Commission and some of the technology policy areas and then I've been working part-time as a consultant and advisor at both the FCC and the Commerce Department uh, in addition to my, my main full-time job as a professor at the Wharton School. Uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I see these technology issues in the Obama administration. And I hate to be rude, but I, I find myself doing this often, uh, which is when I speak somewhere, taking issue with the title of the panel that I'm speaking on. Uh, and I was interested that this one is, is titled uh, Obama's Internet Initiative and, and Social Reform in the US and Japan. Um, and from my perspective, there isn't an Obama Internet Initiative. The Obama administration itself is an Internet Initiative. The internet and ICT are central to the way this administration operates and the way it thinks about uh, and looks at and interacts with the world. So let me very briefly uh, tell you about four aspects of uh, how ICTs, information communication technologies, and the internet uh, are, are core elements to the Obama administration's initiatives. The, the first one I would call ICTs as grammar. 
we had a slogan in the transition team, which, which we called science is back. Uh, and the idea was that uh, not just that we were increasing spending on research, which the administration doubled spending on basic research, but much more broadly that uh, there was a strong belief in data-driven policy making. Uh, that the way the Obama administration wanted the U.S. government to operate was getting all the facts together, getting the best possible understanding, getting all the best possible arguments and using that to make policy. Now, it's a bit odd that this should seem like a novel and controversial way to, to make policy, uh, but that's the situation this administration came into. Um, that data-driven policy um, is intensely technology-based. It's all about data and information. Uh, my friend Kenneth Kukier, who writes for The Economist, actually based in Tokyo, just did a whole survey issue of The Economist on the power of information to transform our world. Uh, and this is a, a core way that this administration thinks about doing public policy. It's, it's one reason structurally as well. The Obama administration brought in a chief technology officer and a chief information officer of the United States government for the first time. So, so the, the use of data and information is, is, is a core, not just to dealing with the technology sector, but to dealing with all of the major national challenges uh, and policy initiatives of the administration. Which leads to my second uh, way that, that ICT is central to this administration, which is ICT as platform. Uh, going back to, if you look at the Obama campaign's technology platform, it talked about this notion that technology is a fundamental enabler for solving all of the great societal challenges that we have before us. So if you think about health care reform, a major policy initiative of this administration, technology, whether it's electronic medical records, uh, whether it's finding ways to link up hospitals with broadband, um, whether it's uh, other kinds of mechanisms to empower people to, to assist with their own health care, uh, technology is a critical enabler, a central way that if we are ever able to improve health care in this country, technology is going to have to be a central part of it. The same thing with reform of education, energy, uh, all of the other major initiatives IT and technology is a, is a critical platform for them. And that, that's something that, that imbues the way this Obama administration is addressing all sorts of issues. There are people in places like the FCC who are working specifically on technology issues. But if you look across the entire government, all the agencies of government, all the major initiatives, they have at their core a recognition that, that technology can be a very valuable and, and in many ways essential way of solving these problems. Uh, the third one uh, I'll call ICTs as, as tool. Uh, how does this administration put forth policy initiatives? I have up here on the screen uh, on the web uh, broadband.gov. Broadband.gov is the website for the national broadband plan that the FCC just uh, launched last week, in fact. Um, and I could have picked any number of other websites. There's data.gov, uh, in which the federal government has put out so far over 118,000 standardized data sets of public information that are being made publicly available through the web. Uh, there's apps.gov, which is about uh, making uh, next generation IT applications available within the federal government. Uh, there's a whole series of these. This one is, is a good example. So the broadband plan is a document. It's a 376 page, uh, three ring binder document that was sent over to Congress, has lots and lots of recommendations in it, but it's much more than that. This is the broadband plan. It's a dynamic website, and as you see scrolling through, um, many of the topics relate to what I've talked about, broadband and healthcare, for example, this recognition that information platforms, broadband networks, uh, are a, a critical tool for solving these major national problems. Um, but it's not just that, it's, it's the idea that policymaking is more than just documents, is more than just uh, passing legislation. Um, but involves using the power of the internet and IT in all its ways. So, here you see consumer broadband tests, the FCC recognizing the lack of data about just what kind of broadband is available, speeds and reliability and so forth, the broadband connectivity put out a tool and said to the American people, you test your broadband connection. 150,000 people uh, have uh, gone here and used this to test their broadband connection in the first week. That's providing a powerful reservoir of data to drive policy making. Um, down underneath that, you see spectrum dashboards. So one of the areas that, that, that I work on and some of my academic work is spectrum policy, uh, a critically important area uh, for all of technology, making available more wireless capacity for next generation mobile broadband services. Um, so what the FCC realized was, we don't even know what the spectrum is being used for today. 
we don't have the information all in one place. Um, the government, you can go to the FCC, they've got all sorts of information rooms and they've got internal databases and so forth. Um, but what this administration did was said, let's put it up on the web. Let's create a dashboard where people can get information about uh, spectrum bands, about what's being used, um, search for information, and, and use that as a portal into the agency. So these are just a, a few small examples relative to this one policy initiative. Um, if you go to some of the other sites, there's a similar FCC one called openinternet.gov. There's an FCC proceeding dealing with whether they need to be rules, this is what's usually called network neutrality, to promote the openness of the internet. Um, you go there, you see not just a document, a notice of proposed rulemaking where the FCC is proposing uh, rules, although that's there. You see a video message from the chairman of the FCC explaining in his own words why he's launching this initiative and why it's important, and you see opportunities for people to comment. So there's tremendous opportunity to use technology to break out of what we in, in DC call the, the inside the beltway mentality, the inherent insularity of government, uh, which I know is, if anything, even a bigger issue in Japan. Uh, technology is a window out, and that leads to the, the fourth uh, aspect of ICT in this administration, uh, and the last one I'd like to talk about, um, which is taking the C in ICT seriously. The C in, in ICT is communication. Uh, and uh, when you think about the potential of technology, what it does is it allows people to connect. It allows people to communicate across distance, across communities, uh, across all the sorts of divides and, and, and things that divide us as people. There's a recognition in this administration of just how powerful that is. And, and that goes back to the campaign. What the Obama campaign did so well was not just broadcast out its message through both traditional television as well as the internet to its supporters. What it did was it allowed its supporters to talk to each other through little things in some cases, like an iPhone application that would let you download your own phone book and make phone calls to people in battleground states that you knew to try and encourage them to vote for Obama, to tools that let people have house parties and so forth. This was during the campaign, and this has been moved into the administration. Uh, the Obama administration has launched a major open government initiative. Um, and the open government initiative has as one element transparency, making the government policy making process more open and transparent through things like disclosing lobbying, disclosing meetings, uh, allowing review of regulations, and so forth. But transparency is just the first leg of that initiative. The second leg is participation, allowing people to actually contribute, citizens to contribute to the process. And the third leg is collaboration, facilitating people connecting with each other uh, and being able to do great things using, uh, again, this platform of technology, this platform of the government as a starting point. And that's really a hallmark more broadly of the way this administration thinks about things and, and a reason that I'm, that I'm encouraged and excited despite all of the challenges and delays and controversies that we're seeing, uh, that something is being built here in this country that's very powerful, not just limited to, to the US um, and ultimately irreversible. Once that culture gets created, things get opened up in a powerful way. So to, to wrap up, the, the broadband plan I think is a perfect example um, of this kind of mentality. The National Broadband Plan of the United States, the title on the front of that document is Connecting America. Certainly one of the reasons for the initiative for the broadband plan is a recognition that the U.S. is far behind peer nations in terms of any index of broadband connectivity. But if you read that document, you don't see a whole lot about the U.S. is falling behind and we have to catch up. You see a lot about the potential of broadband to serve national ends. Because connecting America means several different things. It means physically stringing fiber optic cable and making possible mobile wireless connections to every corner of the country and all that that enables. Uh, but it also means connecting people. And what I think this administration in, in IT is very much about is the idea of connecting people, connecting America to the rest of the world, connecting citizens to their government and also connecting citizens to each other. That's the potential, uh, and I think that's a model that uh, could very well be applied in Japan and other countries as well, and I very much look forward to the further discussion here to get into some of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, that was really fantastic and concise and uh, right, right 
we're really keeping good time here. I just want to note something uh, very quickly. Uh, a week or two ago, I, I did a, a day-long workshop with, with uh, the Department of Defense and Department of State, uh, along with Anne-Marie Slaughter, the, the Director of um, Policy Planning at State, State Department. And I think I, I just want to underscore how important what Kevin just said um, is to the administration, broadly speaking. The United States is trying to think about uh, what, what, it, what is its role um, with, with the rise of, of uh, emerging powers right now. And, and uh, the freedom agenda is in question of, of the Bush administration. Um, containment was in the past. And, and um, I, Kevin really uh, hit on what Anne-Marie Slaughter and others are talking about um, throughout the government, which is convening, catalyzing, and connecting. And those, those are sort of the mantras of, um, of the US uh, agencies right now. And, and this is just one manifestation. Um, that the United States sees itself as a responsible and credible convener of, of, of countries uh, and organizations and, and companies. And, and they also see nothing can be done without the cooperation of civil society and companies. So I'm going to turn it uh, right over to our next speaker, uh, Toshihiro Yoshihara. Uh, he is a, a visiting fellow at the Japan chair of CSIS, where I'm still an adjunct fellow. Um, and uh, he's uh, on loan from NTT. So uh, Yoshihara-san, please, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much for invite me, inviting me and here uh, as a uh, panelist speaker. So my name is Toshi Yoshihara, a country uh, visiting fellow at CSIS, uh, Washington DC based think tank. And the, my current focus is on the uh, technology trend and the some service trend in the telecommunications industry here and also the uh, government's policy on it as uh, Dr. Werbach talking about. Okay, let's move on to the first slide. Okay, so as you know, Japanese economy has been very stagnant since 90s. And also we are facing several social issues, including the aging society. Then now the ICT is expected as a tool to resolve the, those issues, like in the same in the United States. So that's why the government positioned ICT is a very strategic tool. So this slide shows the several government initiatives uh, taken uh, <clears throat> uh, since the 2000. The, in Japan, the first one is called E-Japan. The goal of the E-Japan was a very simple, uh, making the Japan the most advanced ICT country by 2005. At the same time, the government set the IT strategic headquarter in the cabinet office at that time. So in the earlier stage, so this strategy mainly focused upon the broadband infrastructure deployment. And then the after broadband is available in most of the part in Japan, they are moving to focus on the ICT utilization side. And we had the big government change in the last August and from LDP to DPJ. After that, the Mr. Haraguchi took place as a MIC minister, and he announced the Haraguchi vision in the last December. Uh, that covers uh, ICT issues and other issues as well. So and, uh, based on it, or, or I don't know, not based on it, and the new ICT strategic plan will be expected to come out in the next month. Uh, I'll be talk about a little bit on it. And uh, this is the uh, uh, so Japanese government policies. And on the other hand, in the United States, there were no significant government leadership after the 2000 until the National Broadband Plan, uh, as uh, Dr. Barbuck talked. Uh, just, uh, this was published just uh, three days ago. And uh, in the 90s, however, uh, the then Vice President Al Gore's a super information highway was a very well-known government leadership and it spurred the ICT industry here. So 
So after implementing the, those several strategies, so how is the situation now? So in this slide, so we can see the penetration rate of the broadband services. And the map on this slide reflects almost the real actual size of the land. So as you can see, the, so the size of the ja Japan is almost the same as uh, just one state of California. The, but uh, the number on the United States representing the whole United States. So the land sizes are very different between the Japan and the United States, and also the population density is uh, totally different. So the time and the cost for the broadband proliferation should be different between the Japan and the United States. But regarding a fixed line broadband, so wireline based broadband, the penetration is almost the same. So this data is a little bit old, so currently the both has more than 60% now. The difference is on the mobile side. Japan is historically a very mobile centric and the 3G data communications were very, very popular in the United States. They're now getting the popularity after the iPhone launched a couple of years ago. That's the one of the difference of the Japan and the United States. The another difference is the speed of the internet in the wireline side. So this is the type of the broadband service subscribed in Japan. And you can, as you can see, the FTTH, FTTH stands for a fiber to the home, is the most popular access service in Japan now. And it generally offers the 100 megabit per second to each home. In the United States, Verizon and other small companies offering the FTTH service here, but its available area is very limited in the high density area. So I think it takes a very, very long time for FTTH to become a very common access service in the United States because of the very huge big land. And uh, this is a kind of additional information regarding uh, broadband infrastructure. So although we had uh, several government initiatives so far, that does not mean the government spending is, is so large. So in Japan, the mainly the public sector has led the broadband deployment. So regarding the broadband infrastructure, it is so far so good in Japan. The, the, in some rankings, it says Japan ranked as a number one or number two. But the problem is in the ICT utilization side. So the, this slide shows that Japan is uh, lagged behind from other countries. So in education, and government, and the healthcare area, so ICT is not so utilized so well. This slide is another example that shows that Japan is behind from other advanced countries. So this is a connectivity scorecard created by the London Business School teacher, Dr. Waverman. And this scorecard is calculated based on the broadband deployment, and also ICT usage on the government and businesses and the consumers. So under this situation, the Japanese government has been trying to expand the ICT usage. And this is the newest one expected to come coming out the next month. <clears throat> and the Nikkei newspaper reported the discussion draft just two days ago. and. Uh, it might have uh, these three areas. The first one is uh, e-government. The second one is a local human network and that mainly focuses on the healthcare area. And the third one is a uh, new business and global business. So uh, I don't know it in detail, but we are looking forward to seeing it. So let me give you some example of uh, ICT usage for the social purposes. The first one is called the national EPO box, electric post PO box. Now, this is described in uh, iJapan strategy uh, developed by the last government led by the LDP. So this is the kind of one-stop service for the residents to access the pension information and uh, public insurance information and the medical information like that. 
So this service is expected to be launched by the 2013, but uh, currently the government is changed to the DPJ, so the, it's a little bit unclear now. The second example is the ICT usage in the local government in Okinawa. So uh, in this system, for example, the, they established the EHR platform in the right-hand side. EHR stands for Electric Health Record. So, and uh, they make it shareable among the government and the uh, medical institute and uh, some related to public sector. So they can share the, each person's health record very easily and in the timely fashion, and they streamline the process, internal process. The third one is a smart grid. The country smart grid is a country buzzword both in the United States and Japan, and it doesn't have a specific definition so far, but I think it generally means the ICT usage for the effective use of energy or effective production of an, uh, electric energy. So this is a just one example I found recently. This project consisting of uh, electric company and uh, entities, a telecommunications company, gas company, a trading company, and also academic. So I think uh, there are many projects or some initiative is going on both in the United States and Japan and in this area. So. That if broadband or internet become a platform or uh, such kind of applications for social purposes, I think more and more personal data and the critical data is flowing on the net. So in this situation, I think security and the privacy protection is a very, very important. So the government and also private sector and the industry body should give the very high priority on the cyber security. Um, in addition, the another concern is uh, quality issues. So internet is a basically the best effort service. That means it cannot assure 24-7 assure connection, and if the network is very congested, they cannot assure real-time based communications. So if the network congested in the, in the very critical applications like uh, telemedicine, it's gonna be a very fatal problem. Maybe. So one possible solution is a managed IP network. So for example, so NTT uh, launched the NGN. So NGN stands for the next generation network. So this network has the function that can prioritize uh, some specific communications. And the NTT is opening up the, this function to the other third vendors. So any provider can use the, this functions. So the finally, I will a little bit talk about uh, relating the open government policy as uh, uh, Dr. Burbach talked about. So while I'm watching the development of the national broadband plan, I found the policy development process is uh, very, very different between the United States and Japan. So yeah. I think, yeah, that's, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Wabak. I think a national broadband plan is the best example of the, this Obama's open government policy, I think. So they're not only using a, a website for the collecting uh, opinions from the consumers, but also they had uh, many, many workshops and uh, no, uh, made uh, public notice for collecting uh, comments. So they collected the 75,000 pages. So I don't believe our FCC staffs uh, read through the, these whole pages. Uh, but uh, it's a very, very open process. On the other hand, in Japan, uh, <clears throat> each strategy, and so, so uh, of course, so the government was collecting the public comment before announcing the each, each government major initiatives, but the number of comments are very limited and also it is very unclear how those comments are reflected on the final version. So this is the difference. So I don't give uh, any specific recommendation to the Japanese government here, but uh, I think my feeling is that just importing the US model doesn't work in Japan because of the, some culture difference or some li IT literacy difference and so on. So maybe the Okada-san will talk about <laughs> a little bit on those issues. 
So that's pretty much my, of my presentation. Thank you very much. Next, we're hearing from, um, actually, Yoshihara-san, you, you kind of introduced the next speaker, uh, so my job is pretty much done, which is great. Um, <laughs> uh, next, we have uh, Kazuya Okara um, from NTT Data Agile Net, and uh, he is going to talk about a lack of innovation in, in Japan, which is a great segue and, and something that I've been following closely as well. Very, really looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, one thing he didn't mention was that the fact that I'm severely challenged when it comes to public speaking, and I've never done these slides, so if you please bear with me, and uh, I'll make it as less painful as possible. <laughs> and today I'm going to talk about why there seems to be insufficient innovation in Japan in the, in the uh, you know, area of information technology. The description for today's event alluded to the fact that there seems to be a gap, a strange gap between the maturity of IT infrastructure in Japan and the level of innovation that's derived from it. And this is my take on the mystery. <laughs> this is in no way an exhaustive chart and it's not even uh, a cause and effect diagram, but um, I think it uh, covers some key points. For example, uh, we're going to go uh, from one o'clock position and go around uh, clockwise. So the first inhibitor, uh, those hard to get rid of, don't know why it's still there kind of old tradition. For example, in, in Japan, if you've been there, you know, uh, there is almost no online meeting. Almost every meeting's face to face, and only a few office has video uh, conference equipment. And uh, even if your telephone handset has the conference call feature, uh, they don't know how to use it. Uh, not because of lack of literacy, but you know they so rarely use it they forget how to use it. Same with the reluctant, uh, uh, you know, the utilization of telework. I mean, they have the fastest internet in the world, but they don't use it for remote meeting or remote commute. And then there's a tendency to avoid or even frown upon, you know, disruptive change. Maybe that comes from the fact that, you know, Japan is generally uh, has, you know, farming mentality, especially compared to the United States, which maybe has more hunting or hunter kind of mentality. So if you're a farmer, then you must collaborate in order to survive, I guess, you know, more than, you know, when you're a hunter. And perhaps that's why, you know, Everybody, well, every kid in Japan is told to conform, not to differ from your friends and surroundings. And there's, uh, yeah, and the last point that I put over there is the value that, you know, you should work harder. And it is, it is a good spirit, of course, but in the United States, especially the OMB, which is the office of... Uh, management and budget in Washington, D.C., uh, the administrator uh, once said, you know, it's okay, it's good to work harder, but I want you to work smarter. Not just harder, but smarter. And uh, I wonder if Japan has this concept. Now, uh, moving on to the next set of factors that might be contributing to the fact that insufficient uh, innovation in Japan. Uh, well, but you know, there might be, they, they might be innovative actually. For example, look at Walkman or Wii and hybrid vehicles. They're all innovative. 
but just not in the information technology sector or in the public sector for some reason. The other point I'd like to make on this uh, set of factors is uh, the fact that Toyota has been very successful with Kaizen approach and uh, it inevitably tends to be uh, incremental um, improvement and perhaps that's why some disruptive and innovative change is not uh, abundant in Japan. And of course, once successful, if you're a farmer especially, once successful, you tend to cling to that success. I mean, you know, because it's, it's, it's a good pattern. I mean, you know that that procedure will work and give you a good return on investment. But sometimes, you know, you just, uh, you know, cling to that success for too long and it's, uh, you, you know, you don't realize that it's obsolete and the environment has changed and everybody else has adapted to the new world and performing better than you are. Next set of factors. Even if you can innovate, um, you don't want to innovate, maybe. Or you really want to innovate, but the environment does not allow you to innovate. For example, weak economy. Everybody knows that Japan is suffering from 20 years of weak economy, and that obviously discourages investments that's, you know, that uh, you're not sure uh, what the outcome would be. It's just risky. And talking about risk, maybe it is less risky to follow than to explore. Well, not maybe, it's probably so. So why innovate? I mean, let somebody do the innovation and I'll just uh, utilize it, perhaps improve upon it and, you know, have a better ROI than that innovator. Makes sense. One other factor <clears throat> that I'd like to mention is even if you come up with a good idea, it is sometimes prohibited to be implemented. For example, Japan has very strict privacy laws and that new idea that you have just come up with uh, may not be uh, legal or there is strong legal concern and you know, it's very difficult to overcome and very costly and you don't want to do it. The other fact, <coughs> factor is the, the another cultural issue, which is lack of uh, incentivizing innovation. So, for example, if you are a very innovative guy and try to bring innovation to your uh, workplace, but it's very risky. First of all, even if you do succeed, it's under-rewarded. I mean, there's not much reward. But if you do fail, then there is uh, punishment and uh, often irreparably, uh, irreparable damage. And <clears throat> I think this is the last point, but uh, I think it, this is one of the most important point, which is that the way they use or, or uh, utilize the information technology, which is, to me, it seems that they're just automating their existing traditional business process or the way of life, rather than making the, the way you perform business or the, the way you live um, adapt to the technology so that make so that you can make the full use of out of it. Okay, leaving that first chart. Uh, this is a brief comparison of the technology history of Japan and U.S. Um, well. In early 1990s, there was this thing called DOS V, which was like uh, Commodore Perry arriving in Yokohama in, uh, or Yokosuka and uh, opening up Japan to the world, which enabled <clears throat> T 
to use Japanese characters on the world standard IBM PC. The other trend that uh, took place in Japan in late 90s to uh, early 2000s is the fixed price ISPs. So until then, you had to pay per use, you know, per time. But you know, with the introduction of ADSL and uh, other technology, uh, you know, you, you, no matter how much you use your internet, or no, ma no, ma no matter how much you surf and stay online, then and, you know you don't have to pay above a set set price. So that was a big boom. And then that. Uh, Right, uh, and the next evolution was in Japan, as uh, Mr. Yoshihara mentioned, and uh, was the movement towards uh, making, well, similar to information superhighway in the upper right, uh, which is to make Japan's landline very high speed and very available everywhere. So uh, I digress, but uh, what I wanted to show in this slide is that Japan has imported or adapted several concepts and technology trends from the US, but they have left out some key points or key initiatives. And perhaps that is why uh, some, some uh, import is failing, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the recent years. For example, enterprise architecture, uh, very important movement in the United States. However, when imported to Japan, it's been filtered and modified uh, that it means completely something else. And it did not result in the optimization of the organizational structure of the government. And I fear that same thing might be happening in open government. Uh, we'll see, but I'm not quite confident that Japan sees this opportunity as uh, you know, data democracy or democratic uh, movement. Perhaps it's just a way of uh, you know, giving public more opportunity to comment, not necessarily making use of it. So uh, that's my 10 minutes, and this is my contact. I'm located in Washington, DC. Uh, I forgot to mention, but I worked for NTT Data. Uh, which is the largest systems integrator in Japan, and, um, and my agenda is uh, to change Japan through NTT data. Thank you. <laughs> Throughout that, that excellent uh, presentation, I was thinking about how Japan Society in New York can, can help change Japan in a positive direction with, with the Japanese community here in New York and innovating and having a positive impact on Japan. I sincerely believe that. And you know, there's the uh, US-Japan Innovators Program here. You, should, you guys should check it out. And as I really think that um, uh, from, from, from the rock bottom that, that um, I, I think that Japan has hit in, in a lot of ways, uh, there's, a, there's, there's definitely an upside coming up soon. Um, and I, I would like to pass it over to our, our friend, uh, Josh Fouts, who, uh, Ran, uh, uh, speaking of innovative, um, ran with, with uh, Rita King, who's sitting over, over there um, as senior fellows at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, a uh, uh, extraordinary project on virtual worlds and public diplomacy with, with, um, with uh, Muslim countries and Muslim cultures. Um, you'll see that, that uh, Josh just described, uh, describes himself as a cultural affairs futurist. futurist. So, um, I mean that's pretty cool, and and uh, <laughs> but uh, his his um, official title is chief global strategist at Dancing Inc. Productions, the founder of which is uh, Rita King. Great pleasure to have you, Josh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for having me. The, um, I think there's a, we have a natural progression of the speakers here. We're, we've gone from, the, from policy to infrastructure to innovation. And what I, I'd like to talk to you about briefly is application of, those, uh, of these policies. My key area of interest for the last 20 years has been um, improving uh, 
cultural relations use of new technologies um, in a way that is contextually relevant and, um, and, uh, and functional for the um, audience. Let's see, I'm gonna get my, here we go. Okay, um, uh, and I think it's particularly relevant to, for the Japan Society because the, the mission of the Japan Society at its core is to improve understanding of uh, Japanese culture, that is cultural relations. It could be referred to as public diplomacy or cultural diplomacy, depending on which, which euphemism you'd like to, you'd like to use. Um, but the, the gist of it is, is how is it that you can reach out to different audiences in a way that is contemporary and relevant to them. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been looking at, that Rita King and I have been looking at for the last uh, couple of years, is how can we improve cultural relations outreach? Um, and our governments, our organizations, our corporations, using these uh, technologies in a way that actually is resonant with the audiences. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's a, um, one of the examples, uh, a, a more recent one, I'll, I'll back up for a second to, to um, explain it. One of the issues that I think uh, both the Japanese government and the US government uh, uh, is challenged by is the fact that the, and it was referenced in some of the previous speakers, is that the, the culture of the bureaucracy does not lend itself toward innovation. I think one of the great things that Kevin uh, highlighted in the Obama administration's approach to technology policy is that it is trying to encourage a, a culture of innovation. The challenge, I think, is how do you get the bureaucratic culture that is uh, that, that is accustomed in the U.S. to a four-year cycle of governments, of executive branches coming in and coming out, which introduce new policies. You can. I, I was. I was. Uh, I was struck by the by looking at the the history of the of of IT tech policy in the U.S. and Japan, and I remembered the, in the 1990s when Al Gore brought in reinventing government into the U.S., which had a certain similar flavor to a lot of what the Obama administration has been trying to do, which is how can we break through these silos of government and really create collaboration and cooperation with, uh, with the use of technology? Well, I think there are a lot of challenges ahead uh, still to go. Um, one of them I'd like to cite is an example of how the U.S. State Department has room to grow or room to improve on, on their work uh, in, in this particular way. And I think the challenge is that while new technologies ha and, and advocates of, of creative uses of new technologies have been brought into government, um, the government people who are actually on the front lines of cultural relations, and I think that the, the, the Japan Society is very much on the front lines of cultural relations and cultural engagement. Those are the, those are the um, people that, that need um, to be engaged and need to be informed and educated the most. Um, on September 1st, 2009, the new U.S. Ambassador to Kenya, Michael E. Rannenberger, who was a career foreign service officer with deep experience on the African continent, started a Twitter feed. And most all of us in this room by now are aware of Twitter as a, as a popular social media outlet. Um, one of the things that uh, that in his seven the, when the right after the uh, uh, this came out it was lauded as as the first example of Twitter diplomacy. Um, Reuters uh, did a big story about how this innovative use of technology was was uh, was finally being being applied to cultural relations. Um, but one of the questions that I have is was that was this technology being used in a way that is contextually relevant. Um, in Twitter, w one of the ways that you can convey to, some, to your followers or, to, or to, to people a sense that you're actually in a conversation with them is by following them. And we can see that as of yesterday, this, this screenshot, Ambassador Rannenberger was following no one. In, uh, that, well, that, well, that is sort of a subtle thing in the culture of, of, of Twitter. What it means is I'm listening to you. And I think that you uh, in the Japan Society understand that very, very clearly because the conversations and the events that you have are about listening to people as well as speaking to them. How do we create dialogue? Well, in, as we introduce these new forms of social media into our diet of cultural engagement, we need to understand that, that the rules don't change. The rules of cultural engagement never, take, ne never remove that I have to listen to you as well as speak to you. That's how dialogue and transformation and cultural tra uh, tra transformation take place. So I list this as an example of, the way, uh, of, of challenges that um, people who are on the front lines of cultural engagement need to overcome, namely that uh, I think there are some uh, preconceived ideas that technology is a broadcast medium, not a collaborative a dialogue medium. And I think that, the, that those who are, in, who, are, who are part of the conversation using social media realize that it is really a conversation. This was actually borne out by uh, our 
the, the U.S.'s new Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy, Judith McHale, who recently came into office uh, under President Obama, she says, we have to engage, even when we disagree with others, we have to communicate two-way communication, not one-way messaging the, through both government, people-to-people -people dialogue. Um, the, uh, and of course, my, my uh, uh, previous example illustrates that not everyone in, in, the, in the Foreign Service is fully, is fully applying this. Um, uh, Rita J. King and I did a project, as Devin mentioned, uh, called Digital Diplomacy at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. And in this effort, we actually went and explored the role of virtual worlds. Virtual worlds uh, are 3D immersive spaces uh, that, that Japanese culture is uh, very familiar with because of the uh, prevalence of the video game culture in Japan as well as in the, in the US. Um, but it was our premise that in these spaces, substantive cultural dialogue and opportunities for cultural engagement were arising that weren't necessarily being used by governments or NGOs or civil societies. Uh, the end result, what we found in this particular case study, which was looking at opportunities for engaging uh, uh, Islamic societies, was that there was a massive untapped uh, community in which dialogue was taking place that was substantive and meaningful, and we argue actually that was augmenting uh, the kinds of uh, dialogue that take place in exchange programs. I was an exchange student in Brazil when I was 16. For the past uh, uh, 30 years, I have carried with me that experience as a transformative experience. These 3D immersive spaces provide new opportunities not for replacing uh, um, exchange programs, but for augmenting the kind of dialogue that takes place. In an era of fiscal austerity, we've talked about the past 20 years of economic decline in Japan. The US is, is also suffering heavily. How do we find ways that when we can't afford to fly everyone, when we can't afford to bring someone to Japan or to the United States for, for a month or six months or a year-long stay, what can we do to uh, to build a relationship that is that that uses technology in a way that is uh, that fully em embraces it, its potential for dialogue. Uh, why should we do this? Uh, here's just one one chart showing the rapid growth rate of people who are using virtual worlds worldwide. Uh, if, if if people aren't aware uh, uh, of this reality, if you haven't considered the fact that the that that not only do virtual worlds but social media are rapidly becoming a part of the conversation. This is, here's an example. This is a screenshot I took last night of, of, uh, of a Japanese um, community in the virtual world of Second Life where you can see they have the, this robust um, uh, uh, rebuilding of, of palaces and, uh, and such. The, uh, what I, one of the things that I often, uh, uh, that we often find in our, when we, when Rita and I uh, uh, give these, these conversations is, the fa is that um, the response from the policy community is that, they, is that there's a perception that this is, a, that the choice is a binary, that if you, that you have to either use, uh, uh, that if you do uh, technology for cultural relations, then you're actually, w that, that you're implicitly um, uh, uh, removing the physical world exchanges. Um, and, I th and actually, we, we disagree with that. We think that this should be part, an integral part of your outreach efforts. It should be a part of the overall tapestry of outreach and communication that is done uh, in order to facilitate better understanding. A lot of the other things that, that, that challenge people who are senior members of, of, of uh, cultural outreach um, projects are that the technology looks unfamiliar, that the interface is different. And I think this is a big challenge that needs to be overcome. When I, um, uh, when I interviewed a series of foreign service officers over the past year for an article that I published this past fall, I asked them in their posts in, in their foreign countries, in the foreign countries to which they're assigned, how well is, uh, is new media or social media or even immersive media technology being used? How can it be applied? Their frustrations, which was I think an instructive to, to a lot of the topics we've, we've that the other speakers have, have mentioned, was that the, uh, when they were brought back to their home country, in, in this case I was interviewing U.S. Foreign Service officers, they were brought back to Washington for technology training. And uh, in the course of that, the training was being taught by engineers, not by cultural relations people. So you have a disconnect where people who are actually only in charge of building the tools don't actually have experience in applying the tools. So they, they would go, they would spend two weeks in, in, in training, they'd go back to their country, but none of this would be contextualized in a way that was relevant to their outreach efforts. And I think that's a critically important thing. And it, as we think about how is it that ICTs are used in cultural relations, how is it that we are, we're trying to encourage innovation, we need to also think about the fact that people who are on the front lines of doing cultural engagement need to have this technology contextualized in a way that's relevant to them. Um, 
that's, those are sort of my key points. Uh, I realize, I think we're, I don't know how we are on, on time, but, the, but my recommendations are that, that, I, that I continue to sort of try to reframe is that we need to find a way to integrate context, culture, and training into innovation, especially when, it, when it's uh, applied to cultural relations. I think that there is a massive opportunity, uh, a much, uh, a, a, an opportunity that we're missing to create and expand our global conversation across cultures toward better cultural understanding. Thank you.